All right, 2 Kings chapter 13, beginning in verse 14. The name of this morning's message is called Don't Stop on Three. Look at your neighbor and tell him, Don't Stop on Three. When Elisha was in his last illness, King Joash of Israel visited him and wept over him. My father, my father, I see the chariots and charioteers of Israel, he cried. Elisha told him, get a bow and some arrows. And the king did as he was told. Elisha told him, put your hand on the bow. And Elisha laid his own hands on the king's hands. Then he commanded, open that eastern window. And he opened it. Then he said, shoot. So he shot an arrow. Elisha proclaimed, this is the Lord's arrow, an arrow of victory over Aram. For you will completely conquer the Arameans at Aphek. Then he said, now pick up the other arrows and strike against the ground. So the king picked up the arrows and struck the ground three times. But the man of God was very angry with him. You should have struck the ground four or five or six times, he exclaimed. Then you would have beaten Aram until it was entirely destroyed. Now you will be victorious only three times. All the glory, all the honor, the praise belongs to Jesus Christ. And I want to pray over you right now. Father, we thank you so much for the sweetness of your spirit. We thank you for your presence that we don't have to conjure it up. We have to work it up. Lord, you are Emmanuel, God with us. I pray that you would silence every distraction in our life right now. Everything that is keeping our focus from you and your word, I pray that it would be silenced right now in Jesus' name. I invite you, Holy Spirit, to move in this place, touch every heart, touch every life, including mine. Illuminate our life with the coming of your word. In Jesus' precious name we pray. And everybody said, amen. I want to give you a little background and context into what is happening uh, right here, just so that it hits you properly. First of all, Elisha was on his deathbed. Elisha was a mighty prophet in Israel. He was the prophet, the guy in Israel for over 60 years. He was the main prophet in Israel for over the reigns of four different kings. The, one of the things that made Elisha so famous in Israel and one of the things that made him the elite prophet was that every time the Aram or the Syrian army, every time you hear Aramaeans or Aram in the Bible, it means Syria. Every time the Syrians were plotting an attack on Israel, God would like download this secret plan to Elisha and Elisha would run and tell that to the king of Israel and be like, hey, Syria's coming. They're coming from the West this time and they're coming with like 50,000. And every single time God would reveal this to Elisha, Israel would rally their troops in a counter position and drive back the Syrians. It was driving the Syrians insane. They're like, the, the king of Assyria is like executing people in his own ranks, thinking that he's got a traitor among him because how is it that Israel always is one step ahead of them? But it was the prophet Elisha and his connection with God that was showing him the way. Elisha became the most wanted man in Syria. All right, so like wanted, most wanted posters, like were everywhere for Elisha, all right? They were coming for him. He was an incredible prophet, performed many incredible miracles. And I want you to look at what King Joash says about Elisha in verse 14. I'm gonna read to you in the King James because I believe it captures it a little better. At the end of verse 14, King Joash says this as he looks at Elisha on his deathbed. Oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Did you see that? He says, my father, my father, you are the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Let me give you a little translation. You ready? What the king was saying is, Elisha, you and your prayers are more powerful than all of my chariots. Your strategy, 
Your inside from heaven is more powerful than a standing army. You are greater than the chariots of Israel. You are greater than the horsemen of Israel because the Lord has given you insight and perspective to my enemy's plan. It was incredible. So this is a big deal, Elisha dying. And you know, when we read this, we think, oh, King Joash is like a good man. He's doing a good thing because he's coming to support this prophet in his final moments, but not so fast. Joash was a wicked dude, y'all. For 15 years, he brought idolatry and evil reign throughout Israel. The only reason really that Joash was there that day is because the death of Elisha threatened his kingdom. It left him vulnerable to his enemies. If Elisha kicks off and dies, who's gonna tell me Syria's coming? This is why he was here, all right? So you gotta get this context. King Joash is worried about disarray and chaos falling on Israel. Now, I'm gonna bring this home, you ready? I've never preached this text before, ever, and, uh, and I'm just real excited to, to unpack this revelation for you. So I was reading this, and if you pay attention, Elisha, on his deathbed, tells the king, pick up that bow and arrow and start firing some arrows out the east window. And so King Joash does just that. And then the prophet like straight up rebukes him in the same, like the next verse, he's like, Joker, you only shot three arrows. You should have shot five or six. What's wrong with you, Joash? Did you read it? Yeah. The Bible's alive if you don't know, it's alive. All right. And so I'm reading this and I'm like, hold up, Elisha. You're getting like real nasty with him. And he's just doing what you told him to do. Elisha didn't tell him how many times to shoot the arrow. He just told him to shoot it. So why is this old prophet getting angry and rebuking the king all of a sudden? I'm glad you asked. That's a good question. Because the reality is this, and I pray you hear me, church. I pray. I know it's the Sunday after Easter and everybody's out here. I know. I get it. But I pray you don't miss this. The reason that the prophet Elisha was enraged with King Joash over just th shooting three arrows is because he had just told the king, these arrows are the symbol of God's victory over your enemy. Syria has entrenched you. They have whooped up on you. They've embarrassed you for decades. And when you shoot that arrow out the window, king, it is the declaration of God's victory. I gave you a whole quiver of arrows to shoot. Quiver's a weird word, but that means the sleeve where the arrows are, all right? He gave him a whole quiver full of arrows and you only shot three. Here's the reason Elisha's all up in his face because the king held back. The king didn't use everything that was at his disposal. The king had a whole quiver full of arrows, but he only shot three. The reason that the, that the prophet was angry with the king is because he half-heartedly, he went through the motions of just doing what God told him to do, but his heart was not all the way in it. His faith was not really invested in it. Yes, he was doing what the prophet told him to do, but his heart was halfway in it and he was holding back, not giving God his best, not giving God his all. And because of it, it drew a harsh rebuke from the prophet of Israel. And I wonder this morning, has God promised you victory? Has he promised to show up in your life? And are we holding back? Are we holding back from him, not giving him our all? Joash did what the prophet told him to do, but he didn't do it with his whole heart. I pray, Lord, that you would forgive us for stopping on three. I pray that you would forgive us for not giving you our best. I pray that you would forgive us for going through the motions of our faith. I pray that you would forgive us, Lord, for just giving you a half-hearted worship. Lord, forgive us for stopping short and holding back. I pray that you would stir your people today that we would be all in and give our everything to you. Every resource at our disposal, we would lend towards your service. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Colossians chapter three, verse 23 says that whatever you do, do it with all of your heart. Do it with all of your strength. And whatever you do, do it unto God. 
Do it with a spirit of excellence. Give God your best. I don't know about you this morning, but I don't want to be a pastor who stops on three. I don't want to be a husband who stops on three. I don't want to be a person who just gives God what's convenient and then holds back everything else. Some of you husbands, I'm going to talk to the husbands for a minute, so wives, you just relax. We are no different than Joash. We're no different. God has given you a wife. He's given you a family. God has given you victory. He's blessed you. But you're stopping on three. You come home, and instead of engaging with your wife, conversating, you flip on ESPN, you're scrolling on the phone, you are ignoring her. Yes, you're married, but you're not actually embodying what a husband looks like. You think just because you got a ring, now you're a husband? Listen, a ring don't make you a husband. A ring doesn't make you a wife. Just because you stood at the altar doesn't all of a sudden make you a great husband. You actually got to use what God gave you. You got to put your heart into this thing. You got to put your effort, your energy, your devotion into this thing. You can't just go through the motions. If you do, you're going to wind up looking like King Joash going through the motions, stopping on three. I don't want to be a husband who just goes through the motion. I don't want to just stop on three. I don't want to neglect my wife. I don't want to just put her on autopilot. It's getting quiet in here. What it looks like to keep going means that you got to keep pursuing her. You got to keep loving her. You got to just give her flowers on a, something that didn't even holiday. All right. It don't even have to make sense. I'm preaching to myself right now, okay? But what I'm trying to tell you is don't stop on three. Wives, look at your husband if he's nearby and tell him, don't stop on three. Y'all were real quiet on that. I don't even know if y'all were talking. Do you understand the words coming out of my mouth? I'm trying to take this Old Testament text and bring it to life to you right now. There is a message here for you to see it. And yes, you might be married. Yes, you might have a wife. But are you all in? Are you giving your whole heart to her? Are you still pursuing her? Are you still loving? Are you still dating her? Are you going the extra mile? Or are you just doing just enough to stay married and you're stopping on three? God had a victory for Israel, an entire victory that he wanted to give them. But because they stopped on three, they hindered the very promise God wanted to unlock on their land. Husbands, shoot with all your arrows. Don't don't stop on three. Give her your best. Parents, I won't talk to you for a minute. And by the way, wives, that applies to you too. That, That applies to you too. Just flip it. You can do that. You're smart. You're smart. Parents, I'm going to talk to you for a minute. Don't stop on three. I've seen way too many parents, and by the way, I'm not an expert, all right? I don't even have any kids, but I do know the Word of God. So I'm not up here trying to tell you, hey, from my experience and wealth of knowledge. I'm trying to talk to you from the Word for a minute. Is that all right? That's much better than my opinion anyway. I've seen so many parents that want to be BFFs with their daughter or with their son, right? It's like best friend forever, if you're slow on that one, all right? It's like, we just want to be friends, right? And, and I don't want to have any difficult conversations with my kids. I don't want to discipline them. I don't want to correct them. I don't want to get in their face. You know, I just want it to be smooth. I want it to be like easy. I want to be their friend. Parents, you can't stop on three. You can't just be halfway in this thing. You got to go all in. You can't parent on autopilot because if you don't raise your kids Instagram will, their peers will, social media will. If you don't go all in, somebody else is going to. Programming their thoughts, their their ideology with things of this world that are not centered on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Parents, we gotta be all in. We can't be like Joe Ash just firing three out there and be like, well, hope it works out. Like, you gotta be all in here. God has entrusted them into your care. You gotta be all in. And being all in doesn't look like being their friend. Being a mom, being a dad, isn't the same thing as being a BFF. You gotta have real conversations. You gotta confront awkward issues in your your family, raising your children. And if there's one thing I can tell you that I've learned by being a pastor for the last six years, it's this. 
The first six years of me pastoring, I wanted everybody to like me. It's like I was running for mayor. I just want everybody to be happy, all right? But I, I learned real quickly that you cannot effectively shepherd people if you're all the time trying to just keep them happy. There are some awkward and difficult conversations I've had to have over the years. And let me tell you what happens on the other side of awkward, breakthrough. When you have the courage to look a situation that's difficult in the eye, when you have the courage to tell your children that thing you don't even wanna talk about, but you know you got to, there is breakthrough and transformation on the other side of that awkward, tense conversation. Parents, I just wanna ask you, are you gonna stop at three or are you going all the way in? Are you gonna parent with all of your heart, with all of your might and all of your strength? Parents, I would just encourage you with this. Make, a, if you don't even know where to begin, make a list of all the things you wish somebody had told you when you were their age. Keep it age appropriate, all right? Don't get weird on them. But you understand what I'm saying? You gotta look at your children and say, I'm gonna teach you the things that I wish somebody would have taught me. I'm gonna have the conversations with you that I wish somebody would have had with me. Let's be all in. Let's be all in. Don't go through this autopilot checking out. Shoot all your arrows, give God your best. Now I wanna to talk to some employees real quick. If you're an employee, that means you work for somebody else. Shoot your hand up. I work for somebody else. All right, that's most of you. All right, I'm about to get in your face for a minute. You ready? I talked to so many employees living with a bad attitude, feeling stuck, complaining, murmuring, talking about their superior, just, you know, well, I know it better. I, you know, everybody wants to argue. Everybody wants to complain. Everybody thinks that they know it better. And because of your disappointment, you've slipped into a place where you're just doing barely enough just to get by. You're not going above and beyond. You're not giving your best. You're just drawing a paycheck and just thinking about something better. I want to encourage you, if that's your mindset, you are stopping on three. You look at Joash crooked when you read 2 Kings, but you are no different. You're stopping on three. Instead of focusing on everything that's not going right, instead of complaining about every person in that place, why don't you make up your mind to be faithful? Why don't you make up your mind to increase your knowledge and capacity? Why not make up your mind to make that company as profitable as it possibly can be? Why don't you decide to be an example, to stand up, to shut your mouth and be an example of the goodness of God? I'm just gonna drop this on you. It's easy to preach good on Sunday and be like, yeah, amen. But what do you live like on Monday? What do you live like on Thursday when nobody is watching you and cheering you on? As Christians, we ought to be the most employable people out there. As Christians, we ought to be the best people on our job. We ought to be the people going the extra mile, going above and beyond, wowing the customers and wowing our employers, even if they are corrupt, even if they're broken. God's going to bless this place because I'm in it. It's just how you're going to live your life. How are you going to live your life? Are you going to stop on three? Or are you gonna use every gift God has given you? That quiver was full, man. That is a weird word, but there were a lot of arrows at Joaz's disposal, all right? There were a lot of arrows at his disposal and he only used three. At your job, you got a lot to offer. You got a lot of talent, a lot of ability, a lot of things God has put inside of you. Are you just using the three just to get by, just to get through? Or are you gonna give your best? Because what did, what did the word say? Whatever you do, do it unto the Lord. Not for your boss, not for the company, for the Lord. I know it's getting quiet in here, but I'm just trying to preach the truth. And you say, well, I'm not passionate about my job, preacher. You know, I'm just, my passion's not there. You know, they say, if you don't love what you do, then why are you doing it? Don't look at me like you've never heard that. All right, so look, I agree that you ought to be doing what you're passionate about. I agree. I, nothing would bless me more than for y'all to be doing the job that you love and you're passionate, rescuing animals. I don't know whatever it is, okay? But can I just be honest with you? There is a process to being able to do what you love to do. This is what I love to do. Preach, pastor, love this people, build this church. This is what I love to do. This is my passion. This is what I was called to do. But I didn't just start doing this. Can I tell you the stuff that I don't ever talk about? Six years ago when we planted this church, I was a volunteer 
So before I ever got to really do my passion, I had to do a whole bunch of random weird jobs that I didn't even like doing, that I certainly wasn't passionate about, but I had to do that as a step to get to where God was ultimately taking me. You know what one of those jobs was? I'm gonna, I can't believe I'm gonna tell you this. Greg, bro, you know what it is. Cause you were, you, you know, I don't mean to call you out. But it's embarrassing, I'm gonna tell. I don't think I've ever said in the microphone. What? <laughs> when you go to Bible college, there's not a whole lot of options available, all right? If it's either preach or die, all right? So <laughs> it's like, they're not looking for like, oh, he's, he, he's, he's, he's called, I'm gonna employ. No! You know what one of my jobs was for real? First couple years playing this church? I was a courier for urine like drug tests. I'm serious. Y'all looking at me different now. Y'all throwing shade. I know you never look at me the same again. <laughs> Christina's not in this service. She would kill me. Anyway, it's true though. It's true. I can't even begin to tell you how embarrassing that is, but it is true. I took a part-time job making 400 bucks a week, driving urine from Statesville to wherever, just so I could pastor this church. I'm serious. Now, I'm not saying that for y'all to get hyped and all emotional towards me and give more to the offering. We already took it. But, here, but here's what I'm trying to tell you. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. You may not be in your dream job right now, but be faithful. Be faithful. Shoot your arrows. Don't stop on three. Don't do just enough to get by. Give God your best. He's the one who promotes you, not the other job. He's watching how you perform right now. How are you going to be faithful with the job that you deem is beneath you? Are you going to show up on time? Are you going to give God your best? He's the one who promotes you, not anybody else. You may have to go through some things that you're not super passionate about to get where God wants you to be. And now for the past year, by the glory of God, I'm a full-time pastor doing what I love to do, doing what I'm called to do. And, and the Lord is faithful. He's faithful. Some of y'all wonder what I do full-time. Some people think I only work one day a week. Come hang out at the office. We'll put you to work, homie. Put you to work. You think we just sit around. Is this helping anybody? Is this making sense to you? Don't stop on three. And by the way, that job, don't stop there. You know, you're, you know that you're made for more. Don't stop there. Don't settle for that. But just be faithful. Give God your best and watch him use you. I am so far off the nose, it's not even funny. <laughs> Christians stopping on three. Living as close to sin as we can get without crossing the line. Getting as close to that emotional affair as we can get without crossing the line. Doing just enough to be saved. Doing just enough to be blessed. But stopping at three. Worshiping God when you're comfortable, when you're familiar with the song, when you like it. But not pressing through to give him what he's worthy of. I wonder, are you a Christian who's stopping on three? You're coming to church, but you're not a part of the church. You're coming to church, but you're not really the church. And just for free, the church is not a building. Like we're not about to become like official or legit when we get that building. Like what? That's a, that's a building. That's not the church. You are the church. Plugging into a connect group is being a part of the church, serving one another, loving one another, opening car doors, opening up door, greeting people, parking cars, loving people, sending out hospitality. That's being the church, praying for people, loving people. That's being the church. And by the way, when you do it, are you gonna do it with your whole heart? Or are you just gonna do enough to get noticed? Lord, forgive us for stopping on three. Forgive us for stopping on three. If you have your Bible, turn with me really quickly to 2 Kings chapter 5, beginning in verse 9. What I'm about to show you is incredible. <clears throat> 2 Kings chapter 5, beginning in verse 9. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and waited at the door of Elisha's house. But Elisha sent a messenger out to him with this message. Go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored and you will be healed of your leprosy. But Naaman became angry and stalked away. I thought he would certainly come out and meet me. 
I, he said, I was expecting him to wave his hand over the leprosy and call on the name of the Lord, his God, to heal me. Aren't the rivers of Damascus and Abna and Farpar far better than the rivers of Israel? Why shouldn't I wash there and be healed? So Naaman turned and went away in a rage, but his officers tried to reason with him and said, sir, if the prophet told you to do something very difficult, wouldn't you have done it? So you should certainly obey him when he simply says, go and wash and be cured. So Naaman went down to the Jordan River and dipped himself seven times as the man of God had instructed him and his skin became as healthy as the skin of a young child and he was healed. I bet you Naaman is thankful he didn't stop on three. Amen. You got to see this. You, you just got to see this. Naaman says something really amazing here in verse 11. He's a Syrian general stricken with leprosy who hears about a prophet Elisha who has the power to heal. He travels a great distance just to see Elisha. And Elisha doesn't even come out to meet him. He's just like, yeah, go tell my servant, go tell him dip in the Jordan seven times, he'll be fine. And Naaman's like, what? Don't you know who I am? Like, I'm, a, I'm somebody. You're gonna come out here, you're not even gonna greet me? Naaman's like, I expected you to at least like wave your hand over me and be like, be healed, right? And he's like, but you're not even gonna do that? You tell me to go jump in this river seven times? Now I want you to pay close attention here because it's something profound. Naaman was expecting God to do something for him. He said it in verse 11, prophet, you should have just waved your hand over me and healed me. Naaman was expecting God to do something for him, but instead God wanted to do something through him. And God tells him, I want you to go to the Jordan River and I want you to dip seven times. Now listen, Naaman is out there with a bad attitude. He's angry, but he's like hopeless. He's got nothing to turn to. He begins to dip in that Jordan River. His skin is white with leprosy. It's, there are, it's just disgusting. I don't believe it was a gradual healing that Naaman experienced in the Jordan River. Like he dipped the first time and it got just a little bit better. He dipped the second time, it got just a little bit better. Uh-uh. I believe after he dipped three, four, five, six times, he still came up, water dripping off of his arms, and he looks and still sees the leprosy. He's still questioning, is this really going to work? This is foolishness. What am I doing here? But he goes ahead and dips one more time. He didn't stop on three. He didn't stop on six. He went down the seventh time and the Bible says that he came up completely healed and cleansed. I don't know who I'm talking to this morning, but I just came to tell you, don't give up. Don't stop on three. If God has spoken it to you, fulfill it, pursue it. Give him your whole heart. Keep going. Don't stop right now. Now, why? Because faith without action is dead. Faith without works is dead. God is including you in the miraculous. Turn back with me really quickly to 2 Kings 13. I'm not gonna preach much longer, so don't get nervous, but 2 Kings chapter 13, beginning in verse 15. <clears throat> Elisha told him, go and get a bow and some arrows. And the king did as he was told. Elisha told him, put your hand on the bow. And Elisha laid his own hands on the king's hands. That's all I want to read to you right there. Now, this is kind of a weird imagery, but you got to see it because it's, it's, it's preaching a message that transcends time. The king comes to visit Elisha and Elisha says, pick up a bow and arrow. And as the king begins to draw back that bow and that arrow, that old feeble prophet rises up from his deathbed and he puts his hands over the king's hands and guides the king's aim. That might look like a weird scenario to you, 
But what the prophet was actually declaring is that victory is in God's hands, not yours. Victory, the prophet was representing God in that moment, saying that victory, you've been fighting the Syrians for decades, Joash, and you've been defeated every time. But now, when you will yield into the hands of God, victory is in the hands of God, not in the hands of men. So many times we rely on our knowledge, our intellect, our skill, our experience to deliver success into our life. We, we rely on our own selves to acquire the victory. But the truth is, is that so long as we try to conjure up success in our own effort and in our own might, it will be fleeting and it will fall short. But the moment we realize that victory is in the hands of God, not in my own hands, we begin to see triumph and victory. This is an incredible promise. And Israel did experience victory on the other side of this action. Now let me bring it home to you real quick. Single folk in here. Y'all been trying to take things into your own hands. I'll find her. I'll find him. I don't trust the Lord with this. I'm going I'm to handle it because I know what I need. I know what I'm looking for. Now how's that working for you? Just, you don't have to raise your hand or come to the altar. I'm just asking, how's it working for you? Right? But the moment that you begin to trust it in the hands of God. Yeah, I'm preaching this because I've lived it, all right? I, I got married. Somehow the Lord works miracles, all right? But the victory is not in your hands. It's in his. You got to trust him. You got to rely on him. You're out here making moves, but the Lord is the one who brings your victory. Some of you, you've experienced injustice. Maybe your competitors, your competition, whoever have wronged you, they've done you wrong, and now you wanna take things into your own hands. You want revenge, you want justice, you wanna show them what's really right. You wanna show them that they were wrong. You're trying to take things into your own hands, it will never work out that way. Victory is in the hands of God. The, the word says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. As I've heard people, Christians, use that verse, and they're like, you wronged me. My haters, they wronged me. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Like, you know, like, God's going to get you. Like, I'm going to sick him on you. Out of context, anybody? <laughs> the Lord is not saying, hey, I'm going to get after your enemies. The Lord is saying, when he says vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, he's saying, vengeance is mine. I took their penalty. I took their death. I took the price for their mistakes and I extend mercy. That's what that really means. Many times in life, I've tried to do things my own way. I've tried to, to be honest with you, early on in this church for the first three years, I tried to take my experience and my knowledge and tried to build something great, thinking that I knew what I was doing and all this stuff. And the truth is, is that I became an expert of shrinking churches, not growing them. That was funny and you're supposed to laugh right there. So long as I tried to focus on building the church and growing the church and reaching people, all of my efforts failed and we went in the wrong direction. But there came a moment where I shifted my focus and it was no longer about growing the ministry and it became, how do we build a church worth being a part of? How do we build a community that is beautiful, worth being a part of? And the moment that we shifted our focus into God's plan and God's vision, things began to change. Things began to unlock. Lives began to be transformed and, and saved and healed. All I'm trying to tell you is the victory is in the hands of God, not in yours. Stop relying on your own knowledge, your own effort. Trust in the Lord Almighty. In closing, I got to tell you one other thing. The arrow is God's weapon of choice. Look at your neighbor and tell him that. The arrow is God's weapon. If you missed everything I said, I hope you didn't, but if you did, if you missed it all, you were on your phone, you checked out, hear this right here. You ready? The arrow is God's weapon of choice. When the prophet spoke to the king, he didn't say like, pick up your spear, your javelin. There are a whole lot of weapons that I think are like cooler than a bow and arrow. It could have been like your sword or whatever. But the prophet said, pick up the bow and arrow and I want you to strike the ground. There's something unique about the weaponry of a bow and arrow. All the other weapons get their 
force and their velocity from forward motion. But the bow and arrow gets its power from being pulled backwards. Pulled backwards in the wrong direction and held there. But that is the very motion that gives it its velocity, its energy, and its power. And I don't know who I'm talking to this morning, but I want to let you know if your life has, if you've experienced some setbacks, if you've been your life has been going in what seems to be the wrong direction. Your plans aren't working out the way you thought they ought to work out. Your timeline isn't coming to fruition the way you thought it should have. If you're ever feeling negative momentum in your life, do not be discouraged because the arrow gains its momentum and its power from being pulled back in the wrong direction only to then be released into its destiny. And I don't know if you feel like you've been held back in your life Life, you feel like you've been going in the wrong direction. I just came this morning to give you some good news that that's how arrows gain their momentum. Your setbacks will propel you forward into your future. Every disappointment I experienced in the ministry over the years, it was not the defeat of my life. It was the momentum of my life that God would use to propel me forward. All of my disappointments and my frustrations, they carried with them the lesson that would one day send me forward to do the work and the will of the Father. Your disappointments, your discouragement, their power in the hands of God. Arrows are his weapon of choice. It's not too late for you. It's not too late. Just because you've been said back doesn't mean God's not, or God's finished with you. He's not. Last place. Turn with me, Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 2. <clears throat> don't stop on three. I don't know about you, but aren't you thankful that Jesus didn't stop on three? Anybody thankful he didn't stop on the way to the cross? Anybody thankful he didn't stop in the garden of Gethsemane? Anybody thankful he didn't stop on the Via Della Rosa, the way of the cross? Anybody thankful he didn't stop at Pilate's court? Jesus didn't stop on three. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse two. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was said before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be weary and faint in your mind. Jesus endured mockery. His beard was ripped. He was spat upon. He was humiliated. He was shamed. In the Garden of Gethsemane, moments before his betrayal, he prayed, Father, let this cup pass from me if it be your will. There was a human element to Jesus that he did not enjoy the cross. It was suffering, death by asphyxiation. Asphyxiation is a new word that was derived after crucifixion because the death that they died was so violent that there had to be a new vocabulary derived to explain the suffering of the victims of the cross. He didn't stop there for you and he didn't stop for me. Thank you, Lord that you endured the cross, that you despised the shame and you, you endured. You took the nails, you took the crown of thorns and you took my place, you took our place in death. Thank you that you didn't give up when things got difficult. Thank you that you didn't give up when things didn't go quote unquote according to people's plan. Thank you, Lord, that you didn't give up even though while you hung on the cross, we were still sinners and guilty of condemnation. Thank you, Lord, that while we were yet sinners, you died for us. Thank you for being the God who never gives up, who never comes up short, who never gives up on three. And Lord, because you never held anything back from us, 
us. May we be a people who respond and hold nothing back from you. Lord, let us be a people who give you our all, who give you our heart. Let us be husbands who finish the work. Let us be fathers and wives who go all in. Let us be servants, Christians of the Most High God who serve you with all of our heart and reckless abandon. Lord, let us be a people who go all in for you. It is in Jesus' precious name we pray. And everybody said, amen.